This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 28. Coming up on Space Time, rivers raging on Mars late into its history, a girl's night out on the International Space Station called off because of a wardrobe malfunction, and India launches a satellite-killing missile. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has found that significant quantities of water were still flowing down Martian rivers much later than expected. Scientists do know that water carved some deep riverbeds into the surface of ancient Mars, but what they don't know is exactly what sort of weather fed them. Scientists aren't sure because their understanding of the ancient Martian climate billions of years ago is incomplete. Now, a new study reported in the journal Science Advances suggests the runoff was intense, with rivers on Mars being much wider than those on Earth today, and flowing at hundreds of locations across the Red Planet. The study's lead author, Assistant Professor Edwin Kite from the University of Chicago, says the new findings complicates the picture, because it's already hard to explain Martian rivers or lakes based on the information scientists currently have. Orbiting spacecraft have imaged hundreds of long, dry riverbeds crisscrossing the red planet's surface. And rovers on the ground have found rounded pebbles that must have been tumbling on river bottoms for extended periods of time. Kite says the real puzzle is why ancient Mars had liquid water. You see, early in the planet's history, Mars was only receiving about a third the sunlight of present-day Earth, which Kite says shouldn't be enough heat to maintain liquid water. Kite says while observations show ancient Mars was wet enough to have rivers some of the time, other data shows Mars was extremely cold and dry most of the time. The authors analysed images and elevation models for more than 200 ancient Martian riverbeds spanning over a billion years. The width and steepness of the riverbeds and the size of the gravel tell scientists about the force of the water flow, and the quantity of the gravel constrains the volume of water coming through. Their analysis shows evidence for persistent strong runoff that occurred well into the last stages of the wet climate. The size of the rivers implies that water was flowing continuously, not just at high noon. Climate modelers will therefore need to account for a really strong greenhouse effect to keep the planet warm enough for average daytime temperatures to remain above the freezing point for water. The observations show that the rivers were getting shorter, becoming hundreds of kilometres long rather than thousands, However, their water discharge remained the same. So, rather than waning gradually over time, Martian rivers are showing strong flow right up until the very last geological minute before the wet climate finally dried up. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's plans for what was to be the first ever all-female spacewalk as a way of marking International Women's Day didn't go quite as planned after what could only be described as a wardrobe malfunction of sorts, although nothing to compare with Janet Jackson. NASA astronauts Christina Koch and Anne McLean were scheduled to perform an extravehicular activity at Spacewalk in NASA Speak. They were going to exchange existing external batteries on the International Space Station with new lithium-ion replacements. The problem was, there simply weren't enough spacesuit sections of the right size to fit the two female astronauts. The spacesuits NASA use for EVAs come in multiple sections which clip together. Known as extravehicular mobility units by NASA, these are based around two-piece semi-rigid suits, each consisting of a hard upper torso assembly, a PLIS, or primary life support system, which looks like an oversized backpack and incorporates all the life support and electrical systems. There are also arm sections and gloves, those classic Apollo-style bubble-like helmets and extravehicular visor assemblies. The other half of the suit is a soft lower torso assembly, a sort of all-in-one which includes built-in legs and boots as well as body seal closure and waist bearings. Before donning the pressure garment, astronauts first put on what's called a maximum absorbency garment, NASA speak for what really is a modified incontinent stiper. Then there's the thermal control undergarment, which are really just fancy onesie long johns and the liquid cooling and ventilation garment, which incorporates clear plastic tubing through which chilled water flows for body temperature control, as well as ventilation tubes for waste gas removal. 
NASA's Extra Vehicular Mobility Units take into account more than 80 different body measurements, allowing flexible configurations for a variety of differently shaped and sized astronauts. Included are some three different upper torso sizes, eight different sizes of adjustable elbows, more than 65 different sized gloves, two different adjustable waist sizes, five different sizes of adjustable knees, and multiple different padding options for almost every part of the human body. Back on Earth, Anne McLean trained in both medium and large hard upper torso assemblies. And on her last EVA on station just a week ago, she used a large upper torso assembly. The problem is, exposure to the microgravity environment of the space station causes the human body to, well, stretch somewhat, and McCain's body stretched by some 5 centimetres, making her taller and thinner. This meant the large torso section she wore on her last EVA was no longer a good fit. That meant she would instead need a medium torso section, the same size as the one Koch was wearing. And that's where the problem lies. NASA's space station suit wardrobe included two medium hard upper torsos, two large versions, and two extra large versions. However, one of the mediums and one of the extra large are spares that would require at least 12 hours of crew time to be configured. And while that might not seem like a lot of time, it's impossible on a busy space station operation schedule where duties are calculated down to the minute. So the decision was made to allow Koch to wear the medium upper torso assembly on the battery exchange EVA, assigning another space station crew member to work with her, while McCain would have to wait another week. To find out more, Andrew Dugley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. Now Fred, there is a story that has made a lot of news uh, at the moment, and that is the the plan to do an all-female spacewalk, which sadly has been cancelled. Probably only temporarily, I would guess, because I don't think think it'll be long before we've got uh, all-female spacewalks. So, of course, it's part of the routine of work on board the International Space Station. People have to go outside from time to time to not kick the tyres and check the wheels. It's more about changing equipment usually and that involves spacewalks which always involve two astronauts and there were plans for the first all-female spacewalk with two female astronauts because at the moment there are two ladies up there on the International Space Station, Christina Koch and McLean, who are both qualified for spacewalking. So the idea was that there is an installation needed on the outside of the space station and it's installing batteries. I guess these are fairly solid lumps of technology rather than the kind of thing that you put in your camera or anything like that. The installation of those batteries was going to be the very first spacewalk mission with two females. But it's been canned. It's just one of those quirks of fate, I suppose you'd call it. I think it is It is a quirk of fate. But yeah, it's a wardrobe issue because there's only one spacesuit the right size. And it's a medium size. And that's what's caused the issue. It turns out that both these astronauts need a medium sized spacesuit. There are actually two medium sized spacesuits on board the space station, but you need so much preparation. One of them is ready for space flight, one's not, and it needs so much preparation that the more rapid solution to the problem is to basically cancel, for now anyway, the two female space walk. And it comes about because Anne McLean has trained with both medium and large sized spacesuits but it turns out the medium one fits her better and that's probably why the change has been made because Christina Koch is definitely a a medium and so that's what has, has actually caused the issue. Two people the same size. Now you might think well surely a spacesuit is not particularly specific in size. It's just a big kind of bag with air in it that uh, has arms and legs that people get into. But apparently it's all about what's called the hard upper torso, the shirt of the spacesuit, which is a pretty solid part of it, which really needs to fit specifically to the astronaut that's going to use it. And so rather than try and engage on getting the second medium-sized one ready, what has happened is that there's been a change in astronaut rather than a change in spacesuit. There is a comment that's come from somebody called Brandy Dean, who's a spokeswoman at the Johnson Space Centre in Houston, Saying, and this is something I guess you and I have talked about this kind of thing before, people's sizes change when they get into space. Yes, that's right. As soon as you get in microgravity, it brings about changes in the body. Or yes, so universe, in, so. instead they're sending out uh, one of the male astronauts, Nick Haig. That's Dr Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts.
and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. New Delhi has deliberately fired an ASAT missile at a disused satellite, destroying both spacecraft and leaving a cloud of shrapnel and debris orbiting the Earth some 300 kilometres above the ground. Based on NOTAMs, that is, notice to airmen warnings about the location of restricted airspace at certain times, together with the known three-minute flight time of the missile, the target satellite believed used in the test was the 740-kilogram Indian Space Research Organization's Microsat-R, which was launched back in January. The United States Air Force Space Command says it began tracking some 270 new objects, larger than 10 centimetres, in the area where the collision is thought to have been located. However, those numbers are expected to increase dramatically as the debris field spreads out and the Air Force collects more sensor information. Because of the relatively low altitude of the impact, just 300 kilometres above the surface, most of the debris from the test is expected to burn up in the atmosphere within months rather than years. However, the debris cloud could still pose problems for the planned launch of the Progress MS-11 cargo ship carrying fresh supplies bound for the International Space Station. New Delhi claims the test was designed to ensure that in future, China could not use low-Earth orbit satellites to transmit sensitive tactical information during military hostilities, thereby denying the People's Liberation Army an operational edge. India says taking out such satellites will also cripple China's ability to wait cyber attacks. The United States Air Force Strategic Space Command is currently tracking around 18,000 artificial objects in orbit above the Earth. Of these, only around 1,500 operational satellites. The rest are mostly disused spacecraft and spent rocket stages. But these are only the objects large enough to be tracked from the ground. Current estimates suggest there are around 950,000 bits of space junk a centimetre or more in size and a staggering 170 million bits of debris a centimetre or smaller currently orbiting the Earth. And you've got to remember these objects are travelling at speeds of around 27,000 kilometres an hour. One of the big fears is something called a cascade event, where bits of space junk slam into satellites creating more debris, which then slams into other satellites creating even more debris and so on. This scenario is known as the Kessler Syndrome. It was first proposed by NASA astronaut Donald Kessler in 1978, and it involves a runaway chain reaction of collisions exponentially increasing the amount of debris orbiting the Earth eventually reaching a point where the distribution of debris could render space activities impractical for many generations. The first major satellite collision which matched this sort of nightmare scenario occurred on February 10, 2009, when the deactivated 450kg Russian Cosmos 2251 satellite collided with the operational 560kg Iridium-33 telecommunications satellite. The collision occurred some 800 kilometres over northern Siberia at a relative speed of 11.7 kilometres per second, or about 42,120 kilometres per hour, destroying both spacecraft. The problem was made all the worse on January 11th, 2007, when China conducted an anti-satellite missile test using a DF-21 ballistic missile launched from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center to deliberately blow up a disused Chinese weather satellite. The missile slammed head-on into the 750kg Fengyong FY-1C at an altitude of 865 kilometres, travelling at some 8 kilometres per second and smashing both spacecraft into a potentially deadly debris cloud containing hundreds of thousands of bits of shrapnel. The event remains the largest recorded creation of space junk in history, with well over 2,000 pieces of trackable-sized debris catalogued in the immediate aftermath. The test was widely condemned by other spacefaring nations, including the United States, Britain, Japan and Russia. Then on the 22nd of January 2013, a Russian laser-ranging satellite was struck by debris from the 2007 Chinese missile test, severely damaging the spacecraft and changing its orbit and spin rate. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to check out the night skies of April on Skywatch. April is the fourth month of the year in the Gregorian calendar. The Romans gave this month its Latin name Aprilis. Although the name's origins aren't certain, traditional etymology suggests it's from the verb apere or to open, as it's the beginning of the season when trees and flowers begin to open as the northern hemisphere moves into spring. High in the southern skies this time of year is the Southern Cross and its two pointer stars Alpha and Beta Centauri. 
The most distant of the two pointers is Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system to our own. Located some 4.3 light years away, Alpha Centauri actually comprises three stars. There's Alpha Centauri A and B, which orbit each other, and then this Proxima Centauri, which orbits the pair and at some 4.25 light years distant, is currently the closest star to Earth other than the Sun. Like our Sun, Alpha Centauri A is a spectral type G yellow dwarf star. It has about 1.1 times the Sun's mass and just over 1.5 times its luminosity. Its binary companion, Alpha Centauri b, is a spectrotype K orange dwarf star, a little smaller and cooler than the Sun, with about 0.9 times the Sun's mass and about half its luminosity. Alpha Centauri a and b orbit each other around a common center of gravity every 79.91 Earth years. The distance between them varies from about the distance between Pluto and our Sun to that between Saturn and the Sun. The third star in the system, Proxima Centauri, is a spectrotype M red dwarf star with about one-seventh the diameter and about an eighth the mass of our Sun. It takes about 550,000 Earth years to orbit Alpha Centauri A and B. When astronomers describe a star in terms of its spectral type, they're referring to a stellar classification based on very specific spectral characteristics. Scientists can analyze the electromagnetic radiation from a star by splitting its light with a prism or diffraction grating into a spectrum, exhibiting a rainbow of colors interspersed with spectral lines. Each of these spectral lines indicates a very particular chemical element or molecule, the line strength indicating the abundance of that element due to the temperature of the star's photosphere. So, by looking at their spectral lines, scientists can classify not just what a star is made out of, but also how hot it is. Most stars are currently classified using a series of letters O, B, A, F, G, K and M, a sequence from the hottest type O stars down to the coolest type M. Each letter class can then be further subdivided using a numeric digit with 0 being the hottest and 9 the coolest. Stars are also classified by colour, with spectral type O stars being blue, B stars being bluish white, spectral type A stars appear white, F stars appear whitish yellow, G-class stars appear yellow, K-class stars are orange, and M stars are red. A luminosity classification can also be added to the spectral class using Roman numerals. That's based on the width of certain absorption lines in the star's spectrum, which vary with the density of the atmosphere and also help distinguish giant stars from dwarfs. Our Sun, for example, is a spectral type G25 yellow dwarf star, indicating it's a main sequence star, meaning it's fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, and it has a surface temperature of 5800 Kelvin. Over the years, the stellar classification sequence has been expanded, with classes for other stars and stellar objects which don't fit in the general classical system. These include white dwarfs, being sometimes referred to as spectral type D, carbon stars, sometimes classified as S or C, and wolf Rayet stars, which have spectra dominated by broad emission lines of highly ionized helium, are classified as W or WR stars. Also included in the stellar classification system are spectral types L, T and Y, which are assigned to failed stars known as brown dwarfs, some of which were born as spectral type M red dwarfs, but became brown dwarfs after losing enough of their mass. Unlike main sequence stars, brown dwarfs don't have enough mass to sustain core nuclear fusion of hydrogen to helium. The more massive ones, however, are able to fuse deuterium and lithium. Brown dwarfs fit into a category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smaller stars, which are the spectral type M red dwarf stars, around 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or around 0.08 solar masses. OK, let's go back to the night sky. And the nearer of the two pointer stars to the Southern Cross is Beta Centauri, also a triple star system, but located somewhat more distantly at 390 light years. All three are young massive blue stars, far bigger and more luminous than the Sun. Two of these stars, named Beta Centauri AA and AB, orbit each other, while the third star, Beta Centauri B, orbits the pair every 1500 Earth years. Beta Centauri AA and AB are known as a spectroscopic binary, orbiting each other every 357 Earth days. Spectroscopic binaries are detected by spectroscopic data showing the two stars in each system moving towards and away from us. Both are nearing the end of their time on the main sequence and will soon run out of the hydrogen needed for core fusion. The two pointer stars Alpha and Beta Centaurus are named after Chiron the Centaur, a mythical Greek being half man and half horse. 
Chiron taught many of the great gods and heroes, but was then placed in the heavens after accidentally being shot with a poison arrow by Hercules. Next to the point of stars is the thing they're pointing at, the Southern Cross or Crux, the smallest but one of the best known of the 88 constellations in the sky. During April, the Southern Cross lies on its side in the early evening, but becomes more and more upright as the night progresses. The bottom or brightest star in the cross is Alpha Crucis, or A. Crux, which is actually a multiple star system located 321 light years away. It consists of three stars, A1 Crucis, which is a spectroscopic binary, and A2 Crucis. A2 Crucis and the primary star in A1 Crucis are both spectral type B blue stars, with surface temperatures of around 26,000 and 28,000 Kelvin, respectively. The two components orbit each other every 1,500 Earth years, at an average distance of about 430 astronomical units. The spectroscopic binary A1 Crucis is thought to comprise two stars with about 10 and 14 times the mass of our Sun, respectively. The pair orbit each other every 76 Earth days at a distance of about 150 million kilometres, the same distance as the Earth is from the Sun. The masses of A2 Crucis and the larger component of A1 Crucis are both expected to eventually explode as core collapse supernovae, ending up as neutron stars, while the smaller component of A1 Crucis should survive as a white dwarf. The left hand and second brightest star in the Southern Cross is called Beta Crucis, It's also a spectroscopic binary consisting of two stars. These stars orbit each other every five Earth years, at an average distance which varies between 5.4 and 12 astronomical units. Beta Crucis is located about 280 light years away. The primary star, Beta Crucis A, is a spectral type B Beta Cephei variable blue star, which changes in brightness over a period of 4 to 4.6 hours. It has about 16 times the mass of the Sun and about 8 times its diameter, with a surface temperature of around 27,000 Kelvin. The second star in the system, Beta Crucis B, has about 10 solar masses. A third companion has also been detected in the system. However, it appears to be a low-mass pre-main sequence star, which hasn't yet commenced nuclear fusion. Located near Beta Crucis is a spectacular young open star cluster, known as the Kappa Crucis Cluster, or NGC 4755 and more commonly identified as the Jewel Box, the name given it by the famous 18th century astronomer John Herschel. Open star clusters are groups of stars which were originally all born at the same time in the same collapsing molecular gas and dust cloud. Although somewhat still gravitationally bound, it's thought stars in open clusters eventually separate and move to other parts of the galaxy. As its name suggests, the Jewel Box is a stunning collection of more than 100 bright, colourful stars, located some 6,440 light-years away, although its exact distance is difficult to determine because of the nearby Colsac Nebula, which obscures some of the light. The Colsac is a dark nebula, containing lots of gas and dust and blocking out background stars. In Australian Aboriginal Dreamtime legend, the Colsac formed the head of the Emu constellation, with the dark dust lanes of the Milky Way forming the Emu's body and legs. The central parts of the jewel box are framed by bright stars making up an A-shaped asterisk, and these are among the brightest known blue, white and red supergiants in the Milky Way. Gamma Crucis, which is located at the top of the Southern Cross, is the third brightest star in the constellation. It's also one of the nearest red giants to our solar system, located just 88.6 light-years away. Visually, it's the nearest star to the two pointer stars. Although only 30% more massive than the Sun, its expanded outer envelope has bloated out to some 84 times the Sun's radius, and it's radiating some 1,500 times the Sun's luminosity. As a red giant, no longer on the main sequence, Gamma Crucis is nearing the end of its life. Its surface temperature is 3,626 Kelvin, and it has a very prominent reddish-orange appearance. The star on the right-hand side of the Southern Cross is Delta Crucis, a massive, hot and rapidly rotating star in the process of evolving into a red giant. Eventually, it's expected to end up as a white dwarf. This star is located 345 light-years away, and is about 9 times the Sun's mass and 8 times its radius. It's presently radiating about 10,000 times the luminosity of the Sun from its outer atmosphere at an effective temperature of 22,570 Kelvin, causing it to glow with a blue-white hue. The smallest star in the Southern Cross is Epsilon Crucis, which is located in the space between Delta and Alpha Crucis. It's a red giant some 228 light-years away. It has about 1.42 times the Sun's mass, but has bloated out to some 32 times its radius. 
Its surface temperature at 4,148 Kelvin means it's sometimes referred to as an orange giant. The second of this year's major meteor showers, the Leonids, will peak on April the 22nd and 23rd. The Leonids appear to radiate out from the constellation Lyra, close to the star Vega, one of the brightest stars this time of year. The source of the meteor shower are particles of dust and debris shared by the long-period comet C1861 G1 Thatcher. Our northern hemisphere listeners get the best view of the Lyrids. However, those at mid-southern hemisphere latitudes can also see the shower between midnight and dawn. Patient observers will be rewarded with around 18 meteors per hour before dawn from dark sky locations. And now to take a look at what else is happening in the April night skies, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky Telescope magazine. G'day Stuart. Well, we'll start as we always do with the Milky Way, which is our galaxy seen from the inside. At this time of the year, for us in the southern hemisphere, it's stretching all the way across the sky from the southeast to the northwest during the first half of the night, between sunset and uh, sort of midnight. In the early morning hours, after the Earth's turned on its axis uh, a bit, the Milky Way will be seen stretching from the southwest to the northeast. So the sky itself is not moving, of course. We realise it's, it's the Earth that's turning, and up, everything up there appears to turn, but it's really us going around and around and around. Now, in the mid-evening, the Southern Cross, which is the constellation everyone wants to see, is nice and high down there in the south-southeast, so just a little bit around to the left from due south. You're nice and high. It's sort of not on its side, and it's not upright. It's sort of halfway between the two at the moment. The um, second brightest star in the sky is a star called Canopus. That's uh, around to the right of the Southern Cross, sort of go halfway around the sky. It's even a bit higher up, and it's in the south-southwest. And that's the second brightest star in the sky. The brightest star in the sky is called Sirius. And from the latitude of Sydney this time of year, Sirius is almost directly overhead in the early part of the evening. Uh, as the night goes on, um, Sirius and everything else will sort of get lower and lower in the sky down towards the west. But if you look up in sort of almost overhead and spot the brightest star, you can see that will be serious. Over in the west we've got the uh, unmistakable pattern of Orion the Hunter. You can't miss that with its sort of three stars in a row and a big bright star on either side of that. As the night is rolling on, some of the more famous constellations that have been around for this sort of summer season are beginning to drop out of view down in the west, ones like Taurus and Orion. Others like Gemini and Leo, they're still uh, prominent up there in the northern half of the sky, at least as seen from sort of mid-southern latitudes. I get asked a lot about what constellations are. All they are really is they just simply sort of join the dot affairs in the sky, just using stars instead of dots. The ancients who believed in gods and mythology and all that sort of stuff, they immortalized their belief in the seemingly unchanging sky by grouping stars together into sort of vague shapes resembling their mythological figures. So you have Orion the hunter and you've got Taurus the bull and Leo the lion and Centaurus the centaur and that sort of thing. Today, as far as scientists go, we've moved beyond that sort of mythology stuff and constellations really don't have any meaning. They're just a, a quaint way of dividing up the sky now. That's all it is. They're just sort of areas of the sky. Why did the International Astronomical Union narrow down the number of constellations in the sky? Yeah, there were quite a few and they've ended up with 88. Well, some of them were dull. Some of them okay. were pretty dull and, and didn't really need to be there. It was too boring. Uh, <laughs> Too boring, yeah. And look, uh, there was a bit of overlap and duplication in some respect. Well, Argo, would, would, for example, would be a good example. Ar Argo Navis, yeah. Argo Navis has been split up into three, the Vela, Puppis and Carina. Argo Navis was the ship of the Argonauts. That was, uh, I mean, you look up in the sky, you're not going to see a ship of the Argonauts, but someone did at one point and uh, joined all these dots together of the stars and said, that's where we're going to put the ship of the Argonauts. And then it was decided to break, because that was a very big grouping of stars. So that got split up into three more manageable ones, I suppose you could say, which is Puppis, the poop deck, Carina, the keel, and and Vela, the sails of the ship. But there are also circumstances where within a constellation, the stars are sort of um, numbered or, or arranged in order of brightness. So the, the brightest star in a constellation is usually called Alpha, such and such, like Alpha Centauri. Then you've got Beta and Gamma and Delta and Epsilon and all those sort of things. In some cases, where they've redrawn the boundaries of constellations and some stars have actually changed brightness over the years, there is a couple of instances where the brightest star in the ancient part of the constellation might be in another constellation these days. So Alpha such and such might 
might be in uh, the constellation of something else. It's only a few instances of that, but it just, just shows you that it's really all man-made and make-believe, these boundaries and the way we classify and categorise things. And you've got to wonder what they were smoking or drinking or whatever <laughs> when they saw some of the things they saw in the sky, which made them think, oh, that's definitely a scorpion or, or that's a big bear or a little dog. I, I tell you what, yeah, some of them you really do have to use your imagination. Others are really uh, quite easy, like there's a constellation called Triangulum, mm. which is a triangle. A scorpion, well, Scorpius constellation, it really does look like a scorpion you, you know at least, least, least well at least the sort of a uh, stick figure of a scorpion yeah yeah it's got this big sting around the end of it and you've got the, the star antares is right where the heart of the scorpion be antares is this a really fierce looking red star yeah there are a few of them look pretty good but I, I do take your point that you need to use some imagination so you, you have a lot of the ancient constellations but then you have more modern ones like the telescopium the telescope that kind of thing and there's fornax the furnace the ancient constellations tended to be associated with mythology yes yeah, and the more modern more modern constellations over the last few centuries were when people decided to arrange these stars in patterns and name them. They often named them after important inventions or discoveries of recent times. So you've got a few of those sort of things up there in the sky as well. Anyway, um, that's constellations. Now, as for planets for April this year, um, in the evening sky we have Mars. It's low in the west after sunset. It's quite low down, okay, so don't look up high. It just looks like a sort of an orangey red medium brightness star although of course it is a planet so if you, you have a nice clear western horizon after a beautiful sunset or something have a look out there and, and the brightest sort of reddish star you'll see over that way will be Mars. Jupiter is a late riser it's coming up over the eastern horizon today about 11 p.m. it's quite bright and you really shouldn't have any trouble identifying it because it's brighter than all the stars around it. If you have a look on April the 23rd you'll see that the moon is very close to it that's often a really good way to learn the planets when you're just starting out because the path the moon takes through the sky is the same sort of line as the planets line up on so the moon during the course of its 28 day 29 day cycle around the earth will go past each of the planets in turn so you often get a chance to see a planet next to the moon you think aha that bright star I was looking at that is Jupiter okay Saturn is also a late riser it's coming up over the horizon about 90 minutes after Jupiter it's not quite as bright but it has a yellowish tint so that makes it pretty easy to spot and just as I said about Jupiter if you go out on the 20 third you'll see the moon close to it if you go out a few nights later on the 26th the moon will have moved a bit through the sky and it will be now will be next to saturn so that's an easy way to spot saturn the other planets bright enough to be seen without optical aid such as a pair of binoculars or a telescope are mercury and venus and they're both visible in the morning sky during april they're above the eastern horizon venus rises first and it's very bright it's brighter than jupiter it is really really bright it's brighter than anything else in the sky yeah you, look, you simply cannot miss it it's brighter than anything else in the sky other than the sun and the moon it's brighter than all the stars it's a really big bright beacon when it's visible in the morning sky they, they call it in inverted commas the the morning star and when it's in the evening sky they call it the evening star even though it's not actually a star following it up over the horizon about 45 minutes later is mercury mercury has a sort of intense brightness but it's it's not as bright and it's much much smaller okay so you'll see venus and then if you look sort of straight down towards the horizon depending on exactly what time you're out there having a look mercury will be just below perhaps halfway towards the horizon compared to venus that's jonathan nally editor of australian sky Telescope Magazine. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 